In my previous videos I talked about the fact that the sniper competitions in the years of 2005 and 2010 quite significantly changed the requirements for modern sniper weapons. In fact, this created a new level, a new generation of sniper weapons and an understanding of what is needed. However, today I will discuss this topic further in more detail and I will try to explain why this happened, why the requirements were formed exactly. We often discuss how this situation was influenced, influenced by a series of tactical events and technical challenges involving competitors. So where do we start? I will discuss these issues and I have carefully considered its connection. However, I am wondering which aspect we should start initiating the history of modern sniper rifles. We should use American models as a key example. The American sniper rifle set a standard globally. However, diving into this extensively could result in an overly lengthy video which might not suit our format. So focusing on American firearms, it seems fitting to begin our exploration from the mid-1960s. Why this particular period? Well, that's something we will explore. So starting from the mid-1960s, the fact is that uh, this time there was a break in the sniper school. Let me explain. During the Second World War, sniper schools existed. Almost all major armies in the world had a whole system for training snipers, Soviet Union, the USA, Germany and Japan. Then after the Second World War, all this began to decline, which became evident towards the late 50s and early 60s. During this period, there was a shift towards a significantly larger caliber. In the USA and across the NATO alliance, a standard caliber of 762 by 51 was adopted. Finally, the closest equivalent, almost a twin in the civilian market, is the 308 Winchester, also known as the Colibri 300. At this time, the US Army adopted the M14 rifle, which was less prevalent in Europe. In, in contrast, the FNFL rifle was more dominant and widespread, making the M14 less significant by then. There was an intention to create a sniper variant of the M14, similar to how the AM1 Garn was used in World War II. The sniper version of the M1 existed post-World War II for a while. The same model was also used in the Korean War, where similar weapons were deployed. After the Korean War, there was a significant shift, with expectations that future wars would span from the North Sea to the Mediterranean. This anticipated conflict was envisioned to take place in Central Europe, characterized by large tank battles and nuclear weaponry. By that time, the focus on sniper tactics had diminished, with many of the experienced personnel having retired or moved on from active service, changing nature of warfare, especially with the focus on larger scale conflicts, lessened the emphasis on sniper movements. This shift in military strategy reflected a new era where traditional sniper roles were less prominent. At the time of the Vietnam War, many of the earlier sniper experts had retired, leading to changes in military tactics and personnel. Americans again faced the need for sniper weapons in Vietnam because, well, clearly no one there delivered nuclear strikes and tank or thick jungle conditions were practically difficult. Though a turnaround was possible, there were minor conflicts along the roads. Besides, the point lies in the importance of precise shooting and the importance of such weapons in this context, as Vadim Panov put it. Moreover, the Americans were subtly reminded that back in the 60s, particularly in 63, the Soviet Union had introduced a news on the sand rifle. Regarding the Dragonov rifle, an interesting question arises. How much did it influence? Whether it affected Americans or not, it would be interesting to find this source. I couldn't locate it. There's no verified information on the use of Dragonov rifles in Vietnam. Tree-lined rifles and Dragonov rifles were in use. I'm inclined to believe that the Soviet Union was somewhat restrained. Yet, in connection with the 60s, it became evident that the Americans recognized their need for sniper weapons and thus re-established sniper training programs. Sniper schools were invigorated. One of the first was created by the U.S. Marine Corps at the Marine Base Infantry, the Quantic Training Base, where famous legend people like Carlos Hatchcock emerged. After being wounded two times, he served alongside Carl Jumping a legendary Vietnamese sniper during the same era at the same base. Jack Cuddy, known as the father of the M14 and the Mildot, was a significant figure. Captain Jack Cuddy, previously mentioned as the inventor of the Mildot grids and, in general, the Mildot concept in the American Army. 
that in principle measurement systems using a reticle in an optical site with points for measuring angular dimensions and determining range estimation which already existed. But this methodology in the realm of small arms for the Americans was first introduced by him. 1966 saw the dub of the M14. Captain Jack Cody, together with the front of I overall, who is a professor, created an analogy of the Soviet system in 1966. This role is something between a sergeant and an ensign, essentially a super conscript Soviet speaking, but a specialist not from a non soldier background. Together they developed the concept of a new sniper rifle. And in 66, they introduced a straight rifle, the M40, which was presented to the command of the Marine Corps. They demonstrated it to the military as well, but the military had a slightly different approach. According to various sources, some say that 700 were made, but this is from Wikipedia and not entirely trustworthy. There is a fear that there is a mistake here because M40s were created based on the Remington 700 models, specifically in the 40X variety. These have a B-fire receiver, better suited for sport shooting. This design provides higher rigidity when using heavier, thicker barrels required for sport shooting. At that time, the Army did not have a competition with the Marine Corps in the traditional sense. They were simply solving a problem on their own as quickly as they could. They bought the receiver from Remington separately. The barrels were bought separately and fitted Redfield variable scopes, with a magnification range of 3 to 9 including a modification that allowed for range estimation during zoom adjustments. This modified version, known as the EM40, was then introduced, highlighting its features for snipers. At that time, the rifle had a free-floating barrel, the same with the Tata rifle, a concept that is now widely accepted but was not so obvious back. At that time, there was slightly different practice for many rifles, especially in America, involving a technique known as pressure point bedding, described by O'Connor. There was a prevalent method called pressure point bedding, where the contact point was situated above the foreign and the barrel leaned on this point. In this design, the rifle's accuracy was enhanced and it featured a specific focus that significantly reduced barrel vibrations, especially in longer barrels, which were traditionally associated with precision fire. The assumption was that a longer barrel was necessary for accurate and long-range shooting. Nowadays, the understanding of accurate shooting, even at shorter distances, involves various practical scenarios. This pressure point bedding approach has been used in several designs, some of which continue to be made on wooden stocks. The O'Connor method, for instance, involved two contact points positioned approximately 120 degrees apart, which effectively halved the vibration and reduced the chances of misfires. A common issue experienced by shooters 20 years ago. This did not make it possible to create an absolutely accurate rifle there with an accuracy of one arc minute or as, but that allowed at least to say it in the area one and a half minutes to arc minutes. I find it very stable. What Katia Jack implemented was he drew from sports experience, adopting free floating barrel. At that time, in the States, there were, as usual, numerous sports competitions, matches and events that were held continuously and constantly, contests among various shooters, including high precision marksmen. It was then that the use of free-floating barrels became more widespread, with the receiver being more securely fastened. They began employing what's known as bedding, essentially bonding the receiver through bedding, such methods as epoxy resin in the receiver. For those unfamiliar, I'll briefly clarify. When you tighten the receiver butt with two screws, it's not possible to achieve a perfect 100 surface alignment. But you essentially rest on certain points. As it's often said, three points are sufficient for this to occur, fully aligning the receiver with the plane of the firearm, resulting in contact at several points with air gaps elsewhere. Consequently, when you begin shooting, there's a slight potential for movement each time. Marines also acquired experience with rifles in the Vietnam or jungle conditions, where high humidity alternating with intense sun exposure caused our stocks to warp. The stocks absorbed moisture and then dried out, leading to a constant shift in the point of contact, which inevitably affected shooting stability. Clearly, this was not ideal, which is why the M70, a sporting rifle, came into use. The experiences of Marines, including Carlos Hatchcock, who was photographed with a Winchester M70, played a role in this. The M70 was utilized for precision shooting training, similar to the Tarlovsky screws in our regions, where they were once a staple in schools and sports clubs. 
The Marines competed with and even engaged in combat using the MS-70, gaining insights that led them to understand its limitations. This prompted a shift to free-floating barrels and embedding the receiver in a way into a crop. I've elaborated on this extensively, so I apologize for the length. In this manner, the rifle was adopted into service and remained in use as the M70 M40 M40 A1 until around 1972 with the M70 reappearing. So to speak, according to operating experience in Vietnam, the M41 Ivan rifle evolved into the M40 A1 with a composite stock curving away from the traditional wooden stock to a fiberglass one. Later on, modern rifles began using either fiberglass or carbon fiber, with carbon fiber being lighter and more rigid, but significantly more expensive. Fiberglass, used in the 70s, was also employed in making yachts and boats due to its affordable. By 1970, the M40A1 also saw the replacement of its scope with a Arundel 10X magnification model, and the introduction of a 25-inch heavy barrel suitable for 168 grain and 175 grain bullet. This update brought additional changes, like the rifling pitch of 1 to 12 inches, considered optimal for shooting match king bullets. This rifling pitch is still in use today. Unlike the army, the marines and the army were equipped differently for a long time, making their purchases independently. In the military, they opted for a special M100 18 cartridge with several modifications sometimes using a heavier 175 grain bullet instead of the standard 168. Consequently, their barrels also varied slightly in the rifling. Around the beginning of 1996, the M40A3 was introduced. The war gradually ended, new experiences were gathered, leading to the evolution of the M40 into the A3 version. Refitting occurred during the period from 1996 to about 21, where barrels from Schneider Company 25 inches in length and a 1 in of twist were used. This period also saw the transition to Macmillan 4 stocks. Macmillan stocks and the Model 4 differed notably in design. The same fiberglass material was what Fred Macmillan likely introduced from sports to tactical use. This innovation marked the growth of their company, starting, if I recall correctly, in a garage by father and son, with the father being a retired military man. They then shifted their focus to this competitive niche. On the M43, the Macmillan of 4 version was chosen for its flat bottom at the front, enhancing shooting to various pegs, a method commonly used by Marines at the time. They often used their backpack as a rest, placing it in front and keeping it stable while shooting. Bipods weren't as common as they are now, although they did exist. Light machine guns and sniper rifles only became widespread in the 1990s. Another feature was the ability to adjust the rifle's stock, both in length and height, to accommodate shooters of different builds and shooting styles. For a long time, adjustable cheek rests weren't available, leading Marines to improvise their own solutions, often securing them with electrical tape, as seen in many documentary photos and videos. With the introduction of the A3 model, the Harris bipod became standard in the 90s. Specifically, the brown model, a non adjustable type ranging from 6 to 9 inches. This model allowed shooters to stabilize and position the bipod on uneven terrain. Later, in 2007, there was a shift to detachable magazines using bottom plates from Badger Ordnance, enabling the use of detachable magazines. Initially, the M40 had a fixed magazine. Charged one round at a time from above until in 2007, the market introduced the Schmidt Bender PM2. The Marine Corps market was dominated by the Schmidt Bender scope, with the, the Molotov Police Military M2 offering 3 to 12 times magnification and a substantial 50mm lens. This began to be implemented on sniper rifles. The durability of the scope was one issue, but subjectively, it was quite challenging. Almost concurrently with the shift to the Schmidt Bender scope, night vision pre objective attachments started being utilized. To accommodate this, a special adapter was attached to the front end of the optical sight, enabling the installation of the Simrad GM200 night vision device around 2009 in collaboration with the Marine Corps forces and various departments. The A40 A5 was developed, merging requirements for a new rifle. Around the same year, directives emerged from these departments highlighting the need to increase firing range, leading to the introduction of the Mark 13 Mod 5 
designed for the 300 Winchester Magnum caliber with suitable magazines. In April 2018, a budget of $43 million was allocated for the purchase of 356 such rifles, marking a significant change. Concurrently, requirements for a new competition in 2009 were being outlined. This started taking shape around 2004, influenced by experiences from the Afghan camp, leading to the formulation of specifications for a new sniper rifle by 2009. This marked the beginning of the competition in earnest, a topic we will revisit. But for now, let's delve into the Army's history, separate from the Marine Corps. A little bit, so to speak, we will go through the same period of history, but not together with the Marines and the Army. The Army took different approach during the Vietnam War. They opted not for competitive procurement, but for quickly acquiring and adapting what was readily available. They started to modify the EM-14 rifle, which was already in service, by procuring its national match version. This variant, designed for competition, featured higher quality barrels, more selective assembly, enhanced finishing, and naturally, superior wood quality. Initially, they equipped these rifles with a variety of optical sights, but soon began to standardize using ART-1 and ART-22 sights. The sights used during the Vietnam War were known for their automatic ranging and correction capabilities, a unique feature at the time. They allowed for quick range measurement and correction, crucial in a battlefield where targets rapidly appear and disappear. This need for swift range estimation and adjustment was encapsulated in the Sight 1P21. This innovation later influenced and served as a precursor to Soviet sites like the 1P21, the Belarusian version, and Novosibirsk zone model. These sites employing a similar concept date back to the late 60s for the Americans. Their quick adoption reflected an urgency to meet the needs of troops in a way that traditional methods could not leading to a shift towards using fiberglass. Subsequently, they transitioned the stocks from wood to fiberglass, mirroring the Marines with their M40 rifles. And here, credit is due to the Macmillan Company, which was among the pioneers in this area. Picking of the susceptibility of precision rifles to moisture, particularly wooden stocks. This was already known in the sport shooting world was previously mentioned in the video about the museum featuring co glass for stock material. In our episode, we showcased a rifle built on a necroglass base, a transparent plastic. The main aim here wasn't just an artistic statement, but to achieve a stable rifle unaffected by environmental humidity. However, in military applications, such an approach wasn't common, but using fiberglass became the norm. Concurrently, they standardized the use of the 1T2 scope. Although the M14 rifle was phased out of service fairly quickly, replaced by the M16, the M21 rifles remained in use for a while. By the mid-1980s, the military realized they were falling behind not only the Marine Corps, but also the evolving requirements of military snipers at that time. And 1988 marked the introduction of a new sniper system in the Army, adopted as a comprehensive system and termed as such, known as the M24, SWWS sniper weapon system, was essentially a prototype for this rifle XM24. This experimental model was known as the XM24 rifle. Both military officials and marksmen played significant roles in its development. Gunsmiths understood the need and advantage of shifting to the larger caliber, like the 300 Winchester Magnum, realizing early in their rifle's development that the Magnum caliber was necessary. Thus, the XM24 prototype was designed in 300 Win Mag. A novel feature at that time was the incorporation of a five groove rifling design, rifling 5R. This rifling, known as 5R or 5 groove, was asymmetrical, and in this specific instance, bloodline barrel was manufactured using a cruise rate of 12 to 15 inches. The rationale behind the 5 groove design was to minimize bullet deformation inside the barrel compared to symmetrical rifling, which tends to compress the bullet. This asymmetrical design more effectively distributes stress. 
a concept still considered innovative, although from my discussions with many shooters and designers, they agree that there is no perfect solution, emphasizing the importance of the barrel's quality and precision. But returning to the XM24, a significant influence was the adoption of the loophole scope by sports shooters, offering a fixed 24x magnification, a distinctly sporty feature that didn't fully translate to military use as a required versatility for medium and sometimes short range engagements. Pressing a high magnification scope at these ranges proved challenging. The prototype was tested extensively at the shooting range in the camper, performing exceptionally well at the thousand yard range leading to its inevitable adoption into service, later known as the M24. This nomenclature shift from the American XMDM illustrates the transition from experimental to standard military use. When the model bears the experimental X designation, it typically signifies that it's still experimental and not yet officially adopted, indicating it's just a prototype. Once it's assigned the N index, it becomes a model currently in service, as is customary for military equipment. Regarding the sighting system, the initial version adopted featured a fixed magnification scope, starting with the 42X. Various options were available, ranging from variable 3 to 9X scopes to fix 10X. Over time, the different configurations emerged, including different types of turrets, M1, M3, etc. The scope came equipped with a mild art reticle and varying turrets, including M3 and M1 types. The main difference lay in the click adjustment precision with M3 having a coarser adjustment and M1, if I recall correctly, a finer one. Using M1 necessitated multiple rotations, increasing the risk of counting errors, whereas M3 was more straightforward. The scopes featured single turn adjustments, similar to our domestic PUSU scopes, reducing the likelihood of errors. In 98, this scope loophole M4 was replaced by the loophole Mark IV long range with M1 turrets. Harris bipods, known for their precision, were introduced on the XM24 prototype, marking their own unique development path. Simultaneously, the military was experimenting with long range shooting cartridges, initially using the M118 match grade with a 173 grain bullet and later the M118 lore or long range with a 175 grain bullet. Now these cartridges are available to civilian shooters, with companies like Federal producing 308 caliber Federal match cartridges in 175 grain, and Black Hills also offering similar ammo in the civilian market, albeit in smaller quantities than Federal. These brands predominantly supply special forces and certain military units. A distinct note on caliber choice, BM-118 remained 762 by 51 because when the option of switching to 300 Winchester Magnum was proposed, the military, uh, citing logistical reasons, opted to stick with 762 by 51 as it was readily available from any machine gun belt. This decision mirrored the Soviet military's approach, where practicality often guided choices. The M24 rifle, in a sense, became a Frankenstein creation using a receiver that allows for easy barrel replacements in armory workshops, adaptable for both 7.62 by 51 and 308 Winchester, though it predominantly so using the smaller caliber. In the Special Forces, where chain is a constant, 300 win Maggie is often used. Kimpari solutions are common, but Special Forces being less conservative and with stringent requirements started using the same rifle, XM2401 in caliber 300 Winchester Magnum. They employed various Turkish made models in this caliber, hence the XM24 model was developed. This model used the letters Ivan and others to denote subsequent upgrades or versions of the same weapon model, leading to the M224 and its variant. The M24 and two models soon followed, featuring a detachable 5 round magazine. Detachable magazine. Pikakani rails became widely used, with the Pikakani rail and shorter versions appearing on the XM24. Initially only for attaching opticals, the design also included the capability for open sights, both installing a front sight and diopter at the rear, although they mounted on a dovetail, blending dending different standards in a single rifle. However, to use open sights, one had to completely remove the optical sight, which was not ideal. By the late 90s and early 2000s, the trend of pigatinization took off, 
leading to the use of various attachments for large night vision devices and laser designators, influenced by combat experiences in Afghanistan. This period led to new requirements for historical weapons. By the early 2000s, it was apparent that the standard 300A calibers could be replaced by rifles like the SR-25 M110, the Army, with the M110 replacing the M24 rifles. Despite this, M24 shipments continued until about February 2010 under the previous contracts, available in a 2 and M24 A1 configurations but they were being phased out in favor of semi-automatics, which offered comparable accuracy with greater mobility and firing speed. This rapid firing capability was crucial in various scenarios, as repeatedly mentioned, with Afghanistan being a vital point. On one hand, there were tactical scenarios like convoy escorts and providing security checkpoints scattered across the country, where rapid response was essential attack. Prepared attackers often held a numerical advantage, requiring defenders to fire quickly and endure attacks from various directions. In these cases, a semi-automatic rifle held a distinct advantage. Another scenario involved long-range engagements, where American forces, often isolated from air support in mountainous regions, faced similar challenges to those the Soviet military encountered in Afghanistan. Helicopters couldn't always reach high altitudes in the air, forcing reliance on ground-based firepower. The most lethal threats to American and coalition forces were machine guns like the PKM, if made Soviet or in China, enabling the effective engagement and suppression of individual patrols at distances around 800 meters, where the standard EM-4 carbine proved inadequate. This necessitated the development of new, longer-range weaponry. Interestingly, this period from the early 2000s, saw a marked increase in the deployment of designated marksmen, particularly in various military units, not just in every motorized rifle or in specialized units like the Airborne or Mike. When the British, for instance, introduced the Blade 12091. Each division within these units focused on addressing this gap. The Americans restructured and introduced new equipment, while the British, around 2009, adopted the L12091 rifle, which had been discussed in various contexts. If the Americans had the M110 around 2010, the British service included the L12901. This rifle marked a significant shift from previous models. Previously, they had used designated marksman rifles, like the L86, which was essentially a standard L85 with an extended barrel and a bipod, akin to the Soviet RPK. However, the cartridge limitations prompted a change in equipment. With these updates, each unit now included a marksman armed with the L129 rifle. Well, similarly, the Americans started employing the M110 rifle across various units, integrating it into different roles from specialized sniper units to broader infantry applications, bolt rifles, magnum. In the same context of long-range calibers, it was realized that avoidance was not an option, and the Special Forces' long-standing experience with higher caliber rifles needed to be embraced. This led to a shift towards more powerful magnum calibers. Wasner makes one for equipped with a long-range, bolt-action Marin II rifle, and another with a semi-automatic rifle in 762 by 51 caliber, enhancing overall flexibility. This move towards semi-automatics led back to the enhanced sniper rifle, M2010 competitions, particularly in the 2010s, usually known as the Enhanced Sniper Rifle Competition. Goal was to improve sniper rifles based on evolving requirements, with the search for older rifle rifle replacements beginning around 2004. By 2009, technical requirements for the new competition were solidified, propelling the competition forward. Initially, these requirements evolved over time due to ongoing combat experiences and emerging needs, so the military realized the current equipment wasn't fully meeting their demands. The competition process began with the enhanced snipers and Remington emerged as the winner. They modified their Remington 700 model, which had been used by both the Marines and the Army's M24, providing an option to convert these into aluminum chassis, a key requirement. This was because aluminum is exceptionally strong, durable, and non-hygroscopic, resistant to moisture. 
Additionally, they introduced a folding stock, which, when folded, locked the reloading handle, preventing it from moving. These developments formed the basis of the new competition requirements. This mirrored the need for transportability under challenging conditions. Following the competition, industry leaders like Accuracy International and Remington, who also participated, adapted their designs. These companies, despite not winning, continued to develop their models, which were already being sold at the time. Each competitor in the contest revised their designs, and this trend persisted even after the competition. I personally used one of their designs. Initially, it was merely a replacement chassis for an existing receiver under the Enhanced Sniper program, and the model was labeled as the 2010. It underwent several modifications, eventually switching calibers to 300 Winchester Magnum, but concurrently limited quantity options for 338 Lepa Magnum were also available. The Marines, recognizing the value of a genuine receiver, requested a custom version for their existing stocks from the 40s. As far as I recall, about 1,100 of these stocks were produced for the Marine Corps. During military operations, the development of requirements continued to evolve. Among these changes, a key demand was a monolithic Picacchini rail, extending from the receiver's end to as far forward as possible. This was because combat weapons were increasingly being equipped with various night vision devices, and nobody wanted to resort to using cumbersome adapters. The goal was to standardize mounting on a Picatinny rail from the start, which made sense. Post-2010, these rifles began to be utilized more extensively, adapting to a modular and multi-caliber framework. It was realized that having multiple calibers would be highly beneficial for a long time, rifles in certain calibers were preferred for home use, unlike the 300 Winchester Magnum, which was used but also had logistical advantages since it was available in the market for nearly a century. An only recommended calibers included 300 Standard Magnum and 338 Standard Magnum. Simultaneously, machine guns for the same 300 were developed to maintain more standardization in both calibers. Looking ahead, 338 standards in machine guns would need to be further developed for maximum ballistic efficiency. This led to a new competition for the Nasty Competition. A modular approach was adopted, with the key difference being all the same previous requirements, plus the ability to change calibers and do so not in a weapons workshop, but directly at the base or wherever the unit is stationed. On March 7, 2013, the winner of this program, MK-21 Modular Sniper Rifle, was announced as Remington. They introduced a new receiver and added their own chassis with, with probability to change barrels. The only issue was that to change the barrel, the forend had to be completely removed, but ideally, they shouldn't have to disassemble half the rifle. For Nonetheless, they won the competition with a total contract value at nearly $80 million, just under 80 million expecting to supply about 5,150 rifles. But the fires, as usual, were not scheduled a decade in advance. Military operations always start with an experimental phase, typically over two years, during which experiences are gathered, and based on these, the contract is either fully executed or adjustments are made. During these two years of operation, another company, Beard, caught up and even surpassed them. If Remington's rifle was designated Mark 21, then Beard received the designation Mark 22 and was accepted as a replacement for the previous rifles. Everything supplied and the first contract from Remington remained in use, but the contract was, to my knowledge, suspended and the remainder was transferred to the Beard company. Their approach didn't require extensive disassembly. A couple of screws were loosened for easy barrel changes. One interesting aspect of this rifle was blind identification. Barrel identification in the competition required identifying bolt magazines in complete darkness. Manufacturers applied special independent markings on the barrels, such as grooves 1, 2, 3 depending on the caliber, and the magazines had sufficiently large bolt dots to count even in complete darkness. This was an innovative approach and I'd like to discuss it in detail in a separate video. 
covering the technical requirements of the competition and examining each point's significance. This competition was a turning point, in my view, especially for Accuracy International, but they failed to meet the requirements. They tried to make the barrels easily replaceable, but couldn't achieve it like Remington. They still required screwing in the barrel and unscrewing it. But to simplify the process without needing special visors, they cut the receiver and after screwing in the barrel, tightened it with a screw. The military, understandably, did not approve, and as a result, they lost their position. If at the beginning of the 2000s, Accuracy International was the market leader, now they have almost disappeared from the market. We will continue discussing this in a separate video, going through each point of the competition and considering it in the context of the history of these sniper rifles and the technical specifications for various types of modern weapons. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Bye.